Good morning. It is um, a topic of prayer that I wanted to speak about uh, this morning. It's a I've done it a number of times already uh, for us, but I keep learning new things, so I keep wanting to share new things. Um, the it's one of the it's a you all know my my health situation, and we were just told about um, Alan has some uh, health issues going on this week. And it really brings to mind, to, to my mind, how we pray, um, how we go about prayer, what is our purpose in prayer. Uh, and I've been struck because, and, and I do appreciate all of the people that have been praying for me. I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate it. But I wonder oftentimes, what is it that people are praying for, for me? What is it that your uh, is upon your heart for for me as an individual? Um, and I don't want to ever say that it's improper to pray for healing uh, in any way, because the scriptures uh, indicate so many times how how much compassion the Lord has uh, for His people, for the physical well being of His people. The, I mean, the miracles of Christ portray that to such a great degree. Uh, how much compassion he pours out in the things that he does uh, for individuals and for groups at the same time. And then you can think of um, Dorcas uh, with Peter when they come to him in Joppa and say, we, she's done so much for us. Would you not, um, you know, and they're, they're asking Peter to intercede um, with a miracle. And then we also have in the book of James, where James is telling us to pray for the sick. Now, you can certainly, uh, there may be debate uh, between theologians and, and uh, teachers exactly what's being talked about there in James chapter 5 about praying for the one who is sick. Because uh, what is said afterwards is that he will, um, when he called for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if they have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. It's fascinating that we notice that it's the prayer for the sick. And it does say that the Lord will raise him up, but the really important aspects that are noticed there are spiritual aspects, uh, the spiritual life of that sick individual, the, uh, the Lord uh, working in, in, in his life and forgiving sin uh that's a such a greater impact than the healing of the body and again i'm not saying we shouldn't pray for healing um i think that that's a, a legitimate thing to pray for uh, for god's people but we ought to be praying that the lord's will be done uh, that his name would be magnified and glorified in whatever the, the circumstances are for the other individual because it goes back to something that Moses says in Deuteronomy 29. In Deuteronomy 29, uh, it says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but these things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may <clears throat> do all the words of this law. The secret things have always belonged to God. They al always have and always will belong to God. The things that he has revealed, he has given to us. He's revealed them in his word. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have the privilege that a Peter or a Paul had. Um, we don't have the privilege of knowing specifically God's will for an individual regarding their health, regarding what is going on next in God's life and in their life with God. And that's something that ought to inform our prayers. That's something that ought to inform our how we go about praying for individuals, uh, how we go about praying for ourselves, uh, and also how we go about praying for revival. Um, the secret things belong to God. We hope that God will heal our brother. We hope that God will strengthen us. We hope that God will send revival. Uh, but we don't have the guarantee that he will. But we do have guarantees in Scripture of what God will do uh, for us through prayer. 
Uh, and I wanted to look at some of those this morning uh, from that viewpoint, uh, looking at if we pray according to scripture, uh, then we can be confident in what God is going to do uh, because he teaches us to pray that exact way. Uh, we can think of the what people often call the, the Lord's Prayer. I call it the model prayer. Um, but we're not looking at that this morning. What we're going to be looking at is a number of things. Uh, the first one is when we pray for ourselves. How do we pray for ourselves? Well, I think some of the there's two spots that I think are some of the best spots when we consider prayer for ourselves. Uh, the first one, these will be familiar passages. Uh, they, they won't be unfamiliar to you at all, I think. Uh, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, you can turn there. We're going to read the first 12 verses. And think about this when it comes to us uh, before the Lord. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done, the, done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be cleared when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and, the, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, when we're thinking about the things we're going through, the, the difficulties, the trials, the tribulations, uh, the ups, the downs, that prayer that David is giving, and he keeps going, but we're, we're just focusing on a couple of verses. Uh, that prayer that he gives is amazing because what does he want? He wants a right spirit with God. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Align me with you. <laughs> Isn't that a better place than having a perfectly healed body? I'd love to be healed. I'd love to be able to have all the strength I had when I was 20. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but what can happen, I know what can happen. I can have a right spirit with my God. And in verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Re restore that to me and uphold me with thy free spirit. Well, I am completely confident that God can and does and will restore the joy of the salvation that he gives. He does it all the time, doesn't he? He's constantly reminding us of what Christ has done for us. And the joy wells up within us when we realize that Jesus Christ has died for us, that he has given the ultimate price for our benefit, that we are actually the reason he came uh, to this earth uh, to live and to die. That's the joy of his salvation. And that can overwhelm the negative circumstances, the things that seem bad, and the the gift of that of His Spirit uh, upholding us. That is amazing. You you ever feel like you have strength you didn't know where it came from? I can tell you where it came from. It came from the Lord, and He does that. He does that for His purposes, and we can pray accordingly. And then again, I don't want to dwell too long on on any one thing, but. Uh, Keep in mind, if you turn over to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are wonderful. I, I don't know how long, uh, if you've ever taken a long look at them. But the Beatitudes are a fantastic thing about what God is going to do for his people. In verse 1 of chapter 5, And seeing the multitudes, he went up unto a mountain. And when he was set, he, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think about that prayer of, of David just now. Uh, renew a right spirit within him. Well, a right spirit is a humble spirit. Well, what does a humble spirit receive? The kingdom. And that's, that's fantastic. And that's not puffing yourself up. That's not restoring you to perfection. Uh, that's humbling you. And what you receive when you're humbled is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, you think about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We see we see the world around us, and we see all that that's going on in society. And sometimes we'll get distracted and we'll get depressed and think, how in the world can anything good take place? But you keep hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Why? Because you'll be filled. That's the promise of the Lord. You pray for that. You pray for that. And he will fill you. He will fill you. What, what is the righteousness of God? It's Jesus Christ. It's the Lord Almighty. And he is what we seek after. You, if you are seeking after him, he's going to fill you. That's the promise. And we can pray the, these things. We can pray this way in confidence that the Lord will respond exactly as he says he will. That's his desire for us. It's our sanctification. And in the same way, we pray for others. When we pray for others, we so frequently will pray, uh, Lord, heal them. Lord, take away the cancer. Take away this. Take away this scenario. Do you know what God is doing? I don't know what God is doing. I don't even know what God is doing in my own life, let alone what God is doing in somebody else's life. And it's completely arrogant of me to assume that I know the answer is the best thing for anyone else, regardless of best thing for me, is for me to be perfectly healthy or for this circumstance to work out a particular way. I don't have any idea about that. And I want to point out to you what Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1 when he's praying for for the Ephesians. Now, it's interesting because he says that he in verse 15, um, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Now, Paul knew the church in Ephesus. He had been there over two years. He was familiar with them. But what he doesn't do is assume that he knows every intimate detail of their lives. And even if he did, I still don't think he would pray differently for them. Notice what his prayer is. He ceases not to give thanks for them. How often do we give thanks for one another? Thank the Lord for Dennis. Thank the Lord for David. Thank the Lord for Mike and, and Willie and, and Christine and all the others that are here. How often do we thank God for bringing this group together? and for the encouragements that they are to one another. Paul doesn't cease to give thanks for the Ephesians and the way that God's love has been poured out of them in helping with others. But notice when he's praying for them, after he gives thanks unto the Lord, what is it that he wants? Well, he says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, he's praying to the Father through Jesus Christ, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, that may strike you as, oh, well, that's just a bland prayer. That is not a bland prayer. Uh, that is an amazing prayer. He, Paul may not know the very circumstance that one individual in, Ephes in Ephesus is going through at that very moment, but he knows that God can work in that circumstance to bring them to a greater spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him isn't it aren't these sorts of things that god that what god uses to to help us have a deeper understanding of who he is a greater degree of knowledge a greater understanding of his word when he says revelation that's not new revelation that's understanding that it's a personal revelation of understanding what god has said in his word and then he says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that's fantastic Think about the disciples. One of, what's one of the greatest rebukes the disciples receive? To me, it's when Jesus, after feeding the 4,000, he gets into the boat with them, and, and, and they stop off, and he rebukes the Pharisees briefly. And he gets back in the boat, and they're going along, and he warns them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. And here's the disciples. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. And what are they thinking? We don't have enough bread. We've got one little loaf for 13 of us. We don't have enough. 
And Jesus is, is, he seems in the human sense, flabbergasted. How could you not understand? How could you not understand when I fed 5,000 with, with, with so little and fed 4,000 with so little and took up 12 baskets full the first time and seven baskets full the second time? He said, don't you have eyes to see? Don't you have ears to hear? Don't you understand who I am? And that's the prayer that Paul has for the church in Ephesus, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. That's a beautiful phrase. That's, that's that when you're reading, you're understanding things that you haven't understood before. You, you've got a greater depth into, the, into who God is. You're knowing what is unknowable from what we find in Ephesians 3, uh, the, another wonderful prayer for, of, of Paul. And he keeps on going. That what is the, that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is the hope of his calling? Where, what are you, where are you going to be for eternity? Not the place, but with who? With Christ. That's the hope of his calling. That will buoy you up regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how dim and, and grim they seem. We're all, we're all going to shuffle off this mortal coil at some point. We're all going to die. Unless Jesus returns first, we're going to, to, to face that day. Why should we be afraid of it? Why should it take us by surprise? It's going to happen one way or another. But what we can have is the eyes of our understanding enlightened and refocused on the hope of his calling. This is the prayer for Paul of Paul for the church in Ephesus and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I'm fascinated by that statement that Paul makes to the Corinthians. That it's a quotation from earlier in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, he says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those that love him. Now think about that for a moment. We have some descriptions of what glory will be like. We don't have many, but we have some. And we get focused on those. We get focused on pearly gates and streets of gold and a crystal sea, and all these amazing things. And yet, the scripture tells us that we can't imagine, we can't actually think up the wonderfulness of what God has prepared for us. You can come up with the, the most amazing thing in your mind, and it dims in comparison to what God actually has. That's the hope of his calling of the inheritance in the saints. That should make you rejoice regardless of the circumstances. And the circumstances should remind you of it because they remind you that this is the here and now is not the end for the believer. There is a hope of his calling. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? Uh, that's a fantastic two words, to usward. Uh, his power to usward. I love that because it, it reveals to us exactly what this book is about. It's about Christ coming for us. It's his power to usward. That's the whole reason for this book that we have, so that we, it would be revealed unto us who Jesus Christ is and that he would be displaying his power toward us. Now, we can pray for one another along these lines, for the spiritual well-being of the fellow believer. Isn't that what revival is all about? Isn't that what, exactly what we've been meeting for for these years? That we would, we would each be revived, that the Lord would build us up in the faith. That's that the circumstances that, that I don't enjoy the, the side effects from this cancer. I don't enjoy migraines. I don't enjoy these things. But if the Lord is going to use them for this, all right, count me in. That's the, that's the idea that Paul has here in this prayer. Take the circumstances because Paul learned this, didn't he? Think about where Paul was and all the suffering that he went through. I mean, Jesus tells him in very in the beginning, he even tells Ananias when he when Ananias is is is, is not real interested in helping uh, Saul at the time. He says, I'm going to show him the things that he must suffer. Why is he going to suffer? Not to make him feel bad about what he did before, but to grow him into the image of Jesus Christ. And in, in 2 Corinthians, he has the thorn in the flesh. What's the purpose? So that Paul doesn't sin. How, have you ever thought about that in your life? Have you ever thought about the idea that the reason this is happening is so you don't sin because guess what? We're prone to it. 
maybe that's why I, I have the cancer, so that I keep a, a smaller head on my shoulders than I would otherwise. I don't know. But, brethren, we, we have to think how God thinks. And we have to pray how God, how God would want us to pray. And that's for the spiritual well-being of each other, because Paul learned it. He, he prayed to the Lord to take this away, and the Lord said, no, I'm not taking it away. So then Paul starts to realize, wow, that means when I'm sick, he's doing something. When I'm persecuted, he's doing something. When my circumstances don't work out in my favor, he's doing something. All these times that I used to think were negatives are actually positives. The Lord is doing something in my life. And so he starts to pray differently, not just for himself, but for the people he knows and loves. He starts to pray for them that the Lord would do for them what the Lord had done for him. To teach him that that his him being conformed to the image of Christ is the greatest thing. That's the greatest thing. And however God chooses to do that in our lives, that ought to be the purpose of our prayers. That ought to be the thing we, we are concerned about when we pray for Alan, when you pray for me, when you pray for one another, because that truly is revival. And then lastly, when we think about praying for revival, what is it that we pray for? Well, oftentimes we ask for the souls of the ones we love. And and I continue to do that and will continue to do that. I'm not uh, saying anything negative towards that, to pray for the lost, because God can save. He, he, he's proven it with us. Uh, but what is it that Jesus specifically says? Well, we look in Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Pardon me. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 32, it says, as, as they went out, behold, they brought it to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now, that's fascinating. He's healing every disease and every sickness, right? He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But what does it say? But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted. Why? Because they were ill? Because they were hungry? No. And were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd because of their spiritual state. Exactly what we think of in Britain today. We see the multitudes and we, 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 our heart breaks because we realize they have no shepherd. They're sheep without a shepherd. They're, they're all running headlong to destruction. What is it that he says? Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's what we pray for. The, the harvest is plenteous. And I can tell you, brethren, until he returns, there's going to be a harvest. How, however big, however small, there's going to be a harvest until the Lord returns. He, that's his promise. He's not going to stop saving until he returns. Well, what do we pray for? Well, I can tell you here in Yorkshire, I don't know all the ministers in Yorkshire. I would, that would be a, a tall task to be sure. But I can say for this pretty sure, I only know right now, so I think two maybe three ministers that are younger than me. I'm not a young man. And I may seem young compared to our, some of our wonderful brethren on here, but I'm not a young man. That's sad to hear that there's all, that little, that little witness from a younger generation uh, for the Lord. What do we need? We need more men preaching the gospel. We need more women speaking the gospel to their friends, to their neighbors, to their loved ones. We need more of it. It's not that we need uh, we need to sit down and wring our hands over whether or not the Lord is going to save someone. We need to pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest. That's what he says he'll do. He tells us to pray that way. And we can have confidence that he will, that until he returns, he's going to raise them up. Well, let's pray for more of them. Let's pray for so many more than we have to find. Well, we can't find a church for this man, so we'll have to send him abroad. Let's pray that way. Isn't that what we want? Isn't it, Don't we want the gospel to go forth in power? Well, we're promised that it will. Well, we need men to go out and with, with that gospel. 
Let's pray the Lord of the harvest that'll send forth laborers into the harvest. When we pray according to scripture, we can have confidence in the results. Now, we, we don't know the secret things. We ask the Lord to take care of the secret things. Uh, and then we pray according to the revealed word of God. It, it's a fantastic thing to keep in your mind. And I, and I hope that it helps this morning as we come before him in prayer. Let's pray together.